Now let's pick up in our, our series. We're going through the life of David right now. So you have your Bibles, phones, tablets, whatever you're comfortable using. Open up to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to do the first uh, three verses uh, here in just a moment. Now to give us again some context, if you haven't been with us, uh, we, we started with David's life and so he uh, is coming after the first king of Israel named Saul. God has abandoned Saul for Saul's sin, his unrepentedness. And so he goes to anoint a new king. Samuel goes to Bethlehem, which is a little farm town in the middle of nowhere, to Jesse, a man who is nobody. And he goes and he says, I want to see your sons. They bring all the sons out. And he says, no, nah, none of these are it. And he says, wait, my shepherd boy? Yeah, that's who I want. God calls David right then and there and anoints him as the next king of Israel. So then God begins to use David in the life of Israel. Right? Saul has an unclean spirit come upon him, and that becomes very pivotal to the story, especially where we're at. And David is used through his music to heal Saul. Then Goliath comes, the Philistine, and everybody cowers, and David says, you're not going to insult my God. He will prosper me. And he slays the giant Goliath, and he becomes a hero. And Saul begins to parade him around as a hero. And Saul lifts him up. And when he does that, he gets jealous that everybody starts to fall in love with David. Even though David never wanted anything for himself. He then gives his, he says, you can marry my daughter, but you must do this crazy thing. You must go and slay a hundred people and take something unmentionable from them. And that's what he does. And becomes now the son-in-law to the king. His best friend is Jonathan, which is Saul's son. And at this point in our story, Saul hates David with a fiery passion. For as far as we've seen up to this point, for no noble reason other than Saul's insecurity. Saul's still king. Saul is still listened to as king. He just sees God moving in David and hates David because of it. So let's pick up here. What we've had is Saul has tried to kill David three times now. So now David's gone and talked to Jonathan. And here's what it says. It says, David fled from Naoth and Ramah. And he came and he said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me. Why should my father hide this from me? It's not so. But David vowed again, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. But he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. So let's take a pause here. David never really fit in with his own family. Right? When, when the prophet Samuel came and said, let me see your sons, he wasn't even included. That's how ostracized. When he goes to the battlefield and brings food to his brothers, and he has this moment of valor and courage to take on the giant, they say, you're here because you have a treacherous, evil heart. So he doesn't fit in with his own family. So now he's spending all of his time with his new family. These people who essentially adopted him. And his new father-in-law despises him. Now maybe some of you can relate to this enemy. And perhaps maybe in the worst way. What we're seeing in the life of David is intense dysfunction. He's not with his family, and the family he has is falling apart. And what is that? If you look at what he's saying, he feels like it's his fault. He's like, what have I done to Saul? He doesn't begin to say, why is Saul so crazy? He's truly searching his heart and his mind. What did I do to warrant such treatment? And this is a heavy weight for anyone to bear. But David is sincere. He's honest and he's humble. But maybe he's not the only one in this room who's had to deal with this question. Maybe this speaks to your life. Maybe you have a parent relationship. Maybe you're a child of divorce. Maybe you've been abandoned. You sat there and you said, why me? What did I do? Was it my fault? Was it in me that they saw that made them run away? Maybe they didn't leave. 
Maybe they've treated you terrible your whole life. You sit there and you say, what? What did I do to warrant this? You go you rack your brain of all the things you could have done to be better, especially those of us who are older, and you, and you go there and you say, maybe, maybe it's something I did as a teenager or, or as a young adult, and then you start to look back and it's like, I, I don't know what I could have done better. Yeah, I guess I could have been perfect, but what's wrong with me? Why didn't they want me? Like, no one's perfect. No parent's perfect. But every parent has to realize this. You chose to have kids. Kids didn't choose to have you. You chose to have kids. They didn't choose to have you. God bestowed children to parents as a gift. God gave kids a gift to a parent. And no kid should live with the weight of it's my fault. But this is true for David. It's true for your life. If you're somebody who struggles, you were abandoned by someone who should have been biologically programmed to love you. It's not your fault. If you were raised in discord, and hatred, and drunkenness, it's not your fault. If you were abandoned at a young age, it's not your fault. That's a weight many people carry. And it was never meant for you. But here's the reality. We can take those truths and make a better life out of it. Or we can take those things and make a bitter life out of it. You can be better or bitter, but you can't have both. And if you're somebody who just still feels this way, maybe, maybe this is something you've carried since the day you were born. The more you look back, the more it hurts. God is the only one that can bring healing to that. See, David is being sincere. He says, what have I done? David's, it's not David's fault the choices Saul made. It is no kid's fault the choices a parent made. Now, that's true now as you get older. It's not the rest of the world's fault I was mistreated. Because I think a lot of people feel like we have license to take the pain that we feel and inflict it on somebody else. And the problem is, you know who suffers? It ain't the people who hurt us. It's the people we love the most. They're the ones who feel the brunt of our pain. But it needs to start with this. And I ask that you pray and seek the Lord. It's not your fault. But then don't let it be your fault what happens to the next generation into the world around you. You have human agency. What does that mean? Look, it's a little different than free will. We're not here to get into a philosophical debate about the two, okay? But I think it's a better word. What does that mean? It's I've been given what I've been given, period. And I have a choice to use that for the glory of God or out of anger or for myself. David looked at all of this and never once said, what's Saul's problem? He just said, okay, how can I fix this? And he had a great best friend who said, David, I would tell you. I would be real with you, David. If this was your fault, I would tell you. He says, it's not. So don't embody the sin of someone else. Someone else has done that for you. His name is Jesus. He bore even that sin on the cross. That someone else has placed on you. You're free from that one too. It's just a hard one to let go of. Because I think we, 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 we talk about this a lot. Right? I think almost every Sunday we say grace is not giving sin a pass. It's loving a person through the process of repentance. And it's easy to view forgiveness as giving somebody a pass. And it's not. It's freeing you. And it's allowing God to deal with them. And God can deal much greater than you ever will. And we can find hope and peace in that. That it doesn't get washed away because I've forgiven somebody. Not in the eyes of God. Yes, there's grace. And yes, God can even forgive that person. And that whole relationship can change. But God is the one who's the keeper of it. So Jonathan affirms him, look, this is why having really good friends is really important. This is why having church that cares enough to say, hey, this is what's going on is really important. 
Not just to call us out when we're doing something bad, but to lift us up when life has beat us down. That's why, we, it's why what we do together matters so much. So here's the thing. Jonathan says, you know what? You know how I know? Saul can't identify any of your sin. Why? Because Saul couldn't identify his own sin either. Saul is still the hero in his own story. And David's the villain. That's the problem. When I'm the hero, someone's got to be my villain. Very rarely will we recognize we're probably the opposites. Especially in marriage. There's always a hero in marriage. So we think, yeah, no, it's two villains trying to make it work. Right? That's what marriage is. It's two imperfect people trying to do the right thing. It's hard. It's messy. But it has to start from a place of, I need work too. David had that sincere heart. Before he pointed out what was wrong with anyone else, he wanted to be 100% sure that he had not transgressed somebody. He wanted to know 100% that on his end, if he could fix it, he would. Man, could you imagine a world where everyone did that? Instead of looking at my faults and that person's faults and that person's faults, we all just looked inward and said, how can I make this world better? How can I make you better? As a parent, how do I make my wife better? How do I make my son better? Man, this world will be radically different. But it's easy when I'm the hero to say, well, they need to do this for me. And as long as I'm in that place, I'll never be like David. I'll end up being like Saul. And I'm not saying, again, contextualize what we're talking about here. When we're talking about pure innocence and things of children, Right? This is why I kind of took this turn. When I become an adult, I have agency to choose what is right. As a kid, it's not your fault. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm changing gears here. Don't let the devil do that. We're saying once I'm old enough to make decisions, what am I going to do with it? I can choose to be like David, who's filled with hurt and rejection and being told he's nobody his entire life. And I pray every day that I get better at this. Why? That I make Jesus the hero of my story. That, that's really the truth of the whole Bible. When you say, who's the hero? It's not David. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit moving. And that's very freeing. It's, I don't have a cape. All right? I got no superpowers. I can't be nobody's hero. As much as I want to be, I can't. The only one can carry that weight, and that's Jesus. And so they come up with a plan. They come up with a plan. So here's what it begins to say. This is our next, our next verses. We're going to read a lot, and I'm just going to summarize it, because it's all kind of one, one, one text here. So it says, Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. And David said to Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is the new moon, which is a festival, and I know I should not fail to sit at the table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day in the evening. And if your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked, leave me to run to the Bethlehem's, um, Bethlehem, his city. For the yearly sacrifice is there for all the clan. And if he says, good, it'll be well with your servants. But if he's angry, then you'll know that harm is determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant. For you have brought your servant into a covenant with the Lord with you. But there's guilt in me. Kill me yourself. But why should you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, Far be it from you. If I knew what was determined by my father that harm would come, I would, would I not tell you? And David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you roughly? He said, So come, let us go out into a field. So they went both into the field. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be my witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed towards David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, to do the Lord, the Lord do so to Jonathan more also if I do not disclose to you what is, and send you away, so that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you. See, he's been with my father. And if I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. Don't cut me off. Your steadfast love for my house forever. 
when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan and David made swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as his own soul. So they come up with a plan. He says, okay, David, go hide. You're going to go hide, and I will figure out what's going on with my father. David says, okay, tell them I'm going to go to Bethlehem for the annual sacrifice. This was something that should have given him a pass. This was a very culturally acceptable thing to not be with the king, but to represent your people before God. So this was not just a, a vacation. This was a very profound holy day for David, which the king should respect. Now, is it what he's actually doing? No. And he says, look, if he's angry that I'm gone, we'll know. But then he follows it up. He says, Jonathan, if we've been lying, if I've truly done something grievous, this really is my fault. I want you to kill me now. David was not about causing discord and dissension. Look at his heart. He says, look, I, I don't want to dishonor anyone. I would rather be dead than dishonor my God, my country, my king, my father-in-law. I don't want to be sowing discord amongst God's people. This is, and so look, this isn't a self-inflation or self-aggrandizing. David just wanted to be a normal person serving God in a normal way. And he says, I don't want to be a barrier. Yeah, David's hurting. Maybe you've been there. But you thought, you know what, maybe everyone else would just be better off if I weren't here anymore. No. God had a profound plan for David. And God used Jonathan to affirm that. He says, no. God is, the God of Israel is on your side. That's what Jonathan tells him. He says, I will, he says, the Lord, the God of Israel will be my witness. This was the same thing Saul said, right? God is my witness. I won't kill him. But Jonathan meant it. Because Jonathan was trying to do what was right in the eyes of God. He was still trying to honor his father as God expected him to. And he was trying to honor his best friend as God expected him to. Jonathan is in a horrible place right now. Yeah, David's getting it bad, but Jonathan's in the middle. And then David says, Jonathan, what if he kills you? What if he kills you? Jonathan says, if I've been dishonest, I ask that the Lord would kill me instead of you. Because I'm here for you, David. I'm here to honor God. And he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. That the Lord would be with you like he's with my father. Jonathan still sees Saul as the king, the mighty one of Israel. All his failure, all of his demon things that he's allowed to be there, he's seen him lose his mind now several times. A parent will always be a parent. And that's why these things get so hard. Because no one can replace that. They can't. And that's why this loss, those wounds, hurt so bad. So we have to choose the life we have not to inflict that on someone else. Man of God. Because that's what you do. It's like he's still my dad. I still love him. So honor him. I still believe he can be that guy again. So his parents, be that mom. Be that father. Don't let someone else's sin, mistakes, drive a wedge between you and your children. They don't have the right. They don't get that power. God is the God who restores. We sing how He brings dry bones to life. We sing how He gives breath in our lungs. We sing of the greatness of God, which means He can make it happen for your family. And you may sit there and say, i got grown kids and I don't see it happening. God can still make it happen. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. Kids, 
And by the way, we're all somebody's kid. You may not be kid age. Make the best you can with what you have with your parents. Maybe it ain't pretty. It ain't perfect. But you can make it happen. You can make it happen too. Because it's about Christ. And Christ brings restoration. And now you will have closure. If you go to make amends, you say, why do I got to be the one to do it? Well, obviously they're not. They're not. If you go to make amends and they shut you down, the Scripture says, when we go to preach the Gospel, right? they send out the 72. He says, I want you to look for a person of peace. You're going to go out and you're going to preach. And if no one in the city accepts you, you brush your feet off and you keep going. If you've done what you can do, you say, okay, God's got you. I did what I could. And the Lord knows that. My conscience is clear. That's what David and Jonathan have done here. Jonathan says, God's going to wipe out all of your enemies, David. He knew what he was saying. He knew his father was David's enemy. But he says, but remember me as your friend. Remember my descendants. In other words, don't treat us harshly because of what we've done to you. Wow, that's a big ask. Treat us better than we've treated you. And David wholeheartedly agrees. And it says, Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now before you read too much into that, there's, there's this reality. We talked about this when we brought up David and Jonathan the first time. A lot of this wording is so shocking to us today because our friendships are just so shallow that we couldn't fathom caring and loving another human being like this and it not be intimate romantic. But this is what love looks like. It's loyalty through thick and thin. Our problem is our, friend, our, our definition of friendship is so shallow that we consider people friends who really aren't. They're not there for us when we need them. They don't check up for us when we're gone. They don't pick me up when I'm down. They don't point me to Christ when I need it. They're not honest with me when I need it. It's not a friend. Our friendship is so shallow that it's really like a kind of acquaintance. is like, you're my best friend. Why? We do things we like together. Right? That's what friendship is for most of us. We have common hobby. And that's it. No common in any kind of depth. You don't know me. I don't know you. You don't know my story. I don't know yours. That's not friendship. This is friendship. So they make a covenant. Why do they make a covenant? Because sometimes we need more than just our word to remind us to do the right thing. We need something to hold us accountable. Why? We do a terrible job of keeping our word sometimes. Why? Because I remember that what I said a little differently than you did. Not my fault. Right? We didn't write it down. I just remembered it a little different. So we tell ourselves. Right? We can be so flippant in the world today. Like, I can definitely be that way. We have to, so they make a vow. Why? Because they didn't want to sin against each other. They make a covenant. They make a vow. That's what friendship kind of does. It's saying, look, I, I'm going to vow to be there. That's what church is. To be the body of Christ. To pick each other up when we're down. To care. To love. I mean, we've said it before, but I think it's a powerful image, right? It says if we're the body of Christ, right? And I'm, and I'm walking and I, and I cut my arm, right? If I yell at my arm, does it make it any better? If I tell my arm, I told you so, how dare you get cut? Does that make my arm any better? No. Getting frustrated, getting upset? No. What does care, rest, medicine, Somebody's time. Somebody then choosing to help, right? Now my arm needs a sling. I need somebody else to carry it for a moment. That's why it says bear each other's burdens. In other words, I wasn't meant to carry it all by myself. The church was meant to say, if you're falling down, let's pick you up. Let's keep going. And again, that's not giving sin a pass. Part of dealing with this is like, hey, I have a knife in my arm, but don't worry about that. That's your choice. You can just keep that right in there, right? Like, don't, don't you worry about that. This is my choice. This is my knife. I would like it here. No, that's not the way this is going to work, right? Because I love you, we're going to take that sucker out because you're going to bleed to death and die. 
I don't care if it's your choice. I love you more than you love yourself, apparently. That's the church. That's what removing sin from a wound looks like. I'm not doing this to harm you. I'm not doing this to criticize you. It's not gossip hour. Saying, I love you this much more than you love yourself. I've got to help you get you, you got to get rid of this. And I'll help you through the process, not yell at you the whole time saying, why'd you put a knife in your arm? I ain't going to fix it. I can just help through the end part. So let's go to our next part here. So it says this in verse 18. So Jonathan said to him, tomorrow's a new moon and you'll be missed because your sea will be empty. And on the third day, go down quickly to the place where you've hid yourself when the matter was in hand and remain beside a stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a boy saying, go find the arrows. And if I say to the boy, look at the arrows on the side of you and take them, then you're to come. For as the Lord lives, it is safe for you and there is no danger. But if I say to the, to the youth, that, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go for the Lord has sent you away. And it's that matter which you and I have spoken. Behold, the Lord was between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field. When the new moon came, the king sat to eat his food. And the king sat to his seat. And as the other times on the seat by the wall, Jonathan sat opposite. And Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. Yet Saul didn't say anything before he thought, Something must have happened to him. He must be unclean. Surely he's not clean. But on the second day after the new moon, David's place was still empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked to leave me to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go. Our clan holds a sacrifice in this city. My brother commanded me to be there. Now I have found favor in your eyes. Let me go away so I may see my brothers. For this reason, he's not come. So they come up with this plan. He's going to shoot three arrows. Now, why is that? Because Jonathan was not going to send a messenger. Not in a traditional way. He wanted David to know he's putting himself out there. Like, I will make a showing myself. He could have sent a servant. He could have sent an army. He's the prince. He could have sent whatever he wanted. He could have sent a cow. But he says, no, I want to come out there. And I want you to know I'm putting life and limb out for you. I'm going to put it all on the line for David. And see, and this meeting is important because it shows their character. You know what they could have been doing? They could have been conspiring to kill Saul this entire time. The plan could have not have been about peace and salvation and David leaving. It could have been about how do we remove this wicked king. That's what it could have been. But it shows their heart, their character. Now, there's something important here. They do conspire to lie. They, they are conspiring not to tell the truth. And it's very interesting. I, I've been doing a lot of research on this. It kind of comes up more than once in Scripture. Right? You see Rahab. She's a prostitute. She takes in the spies of Israel and Jericho and, and saves them and lowers them down. And she's in the lineage of Jesus. You see this happen, and it saves David's life. And one of the things I think is very, very fascinating is when we look at what, who we're called to be. We as Christians are called to be proclaimers of the truth. That's what Jesus says, right? One of the things he defines himself, the Pontius Pilate says, who are you? He says, I'm the king of the Jews. He's right. And he says, well, that's what he says. He says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, I am. Right? And they, and they start talking. And he says, and you would know this if you were on the side of truth. For all who are on the side of truth know me. For I have come to bear witness to the truth. And, Saul, and then Pilate says something very fascinating. What's truth? And he walks away. So truth is an essential part of who we are. But there are those who have forfeited their right to know the truth. I think it's the best way I can articulate it. I did not uh, come up with that myself. I did go through other commentaries and doctrines and theologians. And this is the best we can come up with. Because in times of war, God honors this if it's going to save lives. I think during Nazi Germany, God wasn't saying, okay, all you Christians hiding Jews, put a sign and saying, I have Jews in my basement. I don't think right now people who are helping Ukrainians flee their country are being, should be saying, okay, hey, Russians, we have them all over here. I just don't think Scripture points us to live that way. So those who are doing war, criminal activity, literal life and death by unjust means, 
you can see this forfeit to know the truth. This is an extremely important way of wording that. Because this is not normal, this is not usual, and this will probably never be used in our lifetime prayerfully. Right? This isn't saying, oh, so the ends justify the means, so I can lie as long as the ends are good. No, 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 no. That is not what this is saying. This is saying those who would take life have forfeited the right to know the truth. And that's it. There's no other space that you can say it was okay, I lied. Look, you just got to get creative. Your wife wears something that doesn't look good. Don't you dare say that it does not look good. Say that is the prettiest dress you've worn all day. It may have been the only one. I didn't lie. Right? I have been at meals with people. Right? Now, I'm, maybe I'm going to be telling on myself if, if this happens, I apologize. And I'm like, hey, you know, you, you see, you're eating. You're like, oh, this is not good. You're not gonna, I'm not going to be rude. You just eat it. I was like, well, how was it? Best thing I've had for dinner all day. I ain't lying. I ain't liking it either. Right? Or you just say, thank you for the food. I'm, I'm, I've been very blessed by this. Right? Man, that word blessing can cover up a whole bunch of things you ain't got to say. Because it's true. I'm grateful. I don't really like it, but I'm grateful. We got to learn to be that way. Instead of saying, well, how do I lie? Not just be honest. Just be grateful. Just say, man, this is great. So as we go on, I wanted to have that in mind. This isn't a normal thing. Now look at how Saul, right? Contrast the character. He says, oh, David must have done something unclean. That's why he's not here. David just did something to disqualify himself. That's why he didn't show up for dinner. He just assumed David was immoral or inept. He just assumed David was sinful. With no right to do so. There will be people who assume you are the worst person on the planet with no valid reason. It's reality. And it's hard when it's somebody close to us. They have no valid reason. David had nothing to warn of this kind of disrespect. He was doing what was right. Which is why we have to be careful who we let speak into our lives. They don't get that right. God does. So let's keep going. So Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse for your shame, for the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, neither you nor the kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? So Saul hurled a spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose to the table in fierce anger, and he ate no food on the second day of the month, for he grieved for David, because his father had disgraced him. So Saul's done. He's now angry at Jonathan. And he says, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That means exactly what you think that means. He says it. He says it to about his own wife. He says, look, this is your mother's fault. You certainly didn't get this from me. There's no way I'm the good guy. I'm the hero. Yeah, he, he says exactly what you think he says there. He says, you are a shame to us. You're a shame. Why? Because you've chosen David over me. And as long as David is alive, all of our family will be in trouble. And basically, Jonathan says, no, we made a covenant. Before he could say those words, when he just said, what has he actually done? Saul throws a spear at his own son. Obviously, he's not very good at chucking spears. This is like spear number four. Ain't, ain't, ain't hit his mark. Okay, apparently, that was not his thing. And everybody should be grateful for that. So he throws it at, at Jonathan. And Jonathan, unafraid, storms out. Like, I don't care. You throw all the spears you want, Dad. You ain't going to hit me. Right? Jonathan's a real warrior. He's like, you, you know, look, you can throw whatever you want. It ain't going to happen. He's not afraid of him. But he mourns. And he fasts. Because now he knows David has to go. His best friend. His brother-in-law. By proxy now, his sister. But the anointed one of Israel has to leave Israel. So this is bigger than just personal. He knows that the Spirit of God is leaving with David. 
and this is huge. So in the morning, Jonathan went into the field as the appointment of David with him a little boy. He said to the boy, run and find arrows that I shoot. And as the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. The boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot. Jonathan called the boy and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called out the boy, hurry, be quick, do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered the arrows and came to his master. The boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and he said, go and carry them into the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the, steam, the stone heap. He fell on his face and he bowed three times. They kissed one another and they wept. And David wept the most. And then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. Because we have sworn both in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord will be between you and I and our offspring and your offspring forever. So they rose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. So they go through with the plan. And Jonathan knows what it means. So does David. They see each other again. Don't read too much in this when it says the kiss. Look, just like Judas kissed Jesus. Paul tells everybody to greet each other with a holy kiss. All right, we're the ones being disobedient, not kissing another man on the cheek. All right, I'm cool with it. By the way, we're not. We don't have to start that any anytime soon. All right, that, that ain't even on my list of things we got to start doing. I'm just saying it's biblical. All right, that's why the Italians they got this down. All right, you know, so it's a cultural thing, but it had a significance of love and care. That I care for this person. And David wept more. And I think it's because he knew he could leave. Jonathan had to go back. And Jonathan was going to do that for him, for Saul, for Israel. He was not going to abandon his post. When he had every right to, Dad literally threw a spear at him. That's pretty severe. Most of us are like, we are out. I'm not here saying, if you're being abused, stay. That's not what I'm saying. Jonathan made the choice. Jonathan made the choice. He says, I know God needs me here. And I will be faithful. David, David, I don't think, knew what he would do. To accept trust God and leave. He had to leave. And they said, what do we have? The Lord. The Lord is between us. And look how they're speaking. So our offspring will prosper each other. Just say, I may never see you again. But your children and my children will make right what's broken. They had faith that whatever they were going to do with this next generation was not going to be what would happen to them. But this is really important. David and Jonathan did everything right. And they were still rejected by the one they wanted affection from. We've got to know this. I would love to say, if you just did the right thing, and you prayed enough, and you went to that person who's hurt you, and you had the conversation, then it'll be butterflies and rainbows the rest of your life. I can't make that promise. I can't. This text won't let me. I can not say this. You are better off knowing where you stand than wondering. That wondering will eat you up the day you die. But if you can know, all right, this is where I stand. Now you're free. But there's another part. Redemption could be possible. You could have that conversation and it could go well. And it could change your relationship to something you never dreamed possible. Because God is real. But either way, you can be somebody you never dreamed possible because God is real. He loves you. He sees you. He cares for you. And no, He doesn't want us to stay in our sin and be bitter and, you know, just, all right, well, I had this tough life, so I get to do whatever I want. No, He doesn't do that either. Jesus knows a thing or two about tough lives. He lived one. God knows more than any of us. And I thought a lot about this recently. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you and I. That means when I'm insulted, God hears that through my ears. That means when somebody belittles me, He hears that through my ears. He feels that through my heart. He sees it through my eyes. Because He lives here. He's not distant from you, 
your pain or your circumstances. That means the flip side's true. That means when I sin, He hears it through my ears. He feels it in my heart. He sees it in my eye. He's not far from that either. He's right there in the thick of it. There's no other God, belief system on this planet that offers that kind of love. You won't find it. You won't find that here on earth. There's no possession, no position, no person. And I'm sure you love your spouse and your spouse loves you and you love your kid and your kid loves you. But the relationship you have with God is unique. We were made for Him. And He remakes us for everyone else. Don't give up. Don't let people, don't let your past, don't let people who were biologically programmed to love you dictate your life anymore. Only God has that right. Because He created you. When you look at the creation story, right, God speaks everything into existence. In the book of Isaiah, it says He breathes out stars just because it was a whim. Just as He can. But He knit you in your mother's womb. He numbered the hairs on your head. He bottles the tears from your eyes. God spoke everything else, but He got His hands dirty for you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. God's workmanship. The greatest craftsman to ever craft. Don't let anyone else dictate who you are. What you do. He's the one with the right. And He is love. And that's why when we have sin, it is worth it to say, you know what God, I let it go. I don't want to be this person because I know you're crafting me to something beautiful. I keep putting things in the way of it. I keep splintering shards off. I keep trying to, trying to keep you from being able to complete me. I want to get this sin out so I can be complete in Christ. Because until I do, I will be incomplete. I will have a thorn, as Paul said. No one's going to be perfect. But we strive. We encourage. We keep moving forward. Don't let somebody take away the beautiful life that God is trying to create. Pastor John Gabe is going to come up in and close this out here in just a moment. I'm going to be in the back. Our prayer partner is going to be in the back. Again, that's not gossip hour. That's genuinely, if you need somebody to pray for you, let somebody pray for you. Maybe you've got a wound. Maybe you're, you're working through it and right now you're like, maybe I'm not as worked through as I thought. That's okay. But pray with somebody. Let somebody do the thing we just said. Let somebody walk beside you and say, hey, let's pray to God to heal that. Because He's the only one that can fix it. Maybe you're somebody who's saying, look, I'm just struggling as a parent on my own. I had good parents. Man, I'm struggling. Let somebody pray for you. Maybe you're like, man, just me as a person, my identity, just trying to walk and get my life together. I'm single, or I don't have kids, or whatever. I'm just trying to get my life together, and it's not. Let somebody pray for you. That's what the church is here for.